Hi, I am Ajit Virkud, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology from Mumbai. Hello citizens of the internet. Today I am going to talk to you about gestational diabetes mellitus. I will cover the important topic in two parts. In the first part, I will discuss the epidemiology, pathophysiology and screening come diagnosis of GDM. In the second part, I will dwell upon the management of GDM with special emphasis on long-term consequences of GDM and its primordial prevention. Gestational diabetes mellitus is defined as any degree of carbohydrate intolerance with onset or first recognition in pregnancy. 90% of the cases of diabetes mellitus seen in pregnancy are GDM and the remaining 10% are pre-gestational diabetes mellitus that is PGDM. The prevalence of GDM in rural India is about 9.9%. In semi-urban India, it is 13.8%, whereas in urban areas, it is as high as 17.8%. This shows that GDM is more prevalent in urban areas than in rural areas. The average prevalence of GDM in India is 13.9%. GDM has become a public health issue in India. The prevalence varies greatly in different populations of different geographical areas in the world. It is directly proportional to the prevalence of impaired glucose tolerance in the given population in that geographical area. The important risk factors for GDM are age greater than or equal to 25 years, obesity which is defined as BMI greater than or equal to 25, family history of diabetes mellitus in first degree relative and ethnicity. Prevalence has been found to be significantly high in South Asian women. Before I explain the pathophysiology of GDM, I need to describe the effect of pregnancy on glucose metabolism. Pregnancy is a diabetogenic state because the placenta produces many hormones that are antagonistic to insulin action. Human placental lactogen diminishes the action of insulin on peripheral tissues. High levels of estrogens and progesterones oppose the glucose-lowering effect of insulin. Placenta secretes an enzyme called as insulinase. Increase in free active cortisol is antagonist to insulin. These are all the reasons why pregnancy unmasks diabetes mellitus in latent diabetic subjects. This is known as gestational diabetes. Now I will explain the pathophysiology of GDM using simple illustrations. In normal individuals, Insulin secretion is proportional to the insulin requirement, thus there is no diabetes. But when the woman becomes pregnant, there is insulin resistance as a result of anti-insulin hormones produced by the placenta. However, the maternal beta cells of the pancreas are able to compensate by increasing insulin production to match the need. As a result, there is no glucose intolerance in the pregnant woman. In about 10% of women, however, the pancreas is unable to increase the insulin secretion enough to overcome the insulin resistance that develops in pregnancy, resulting in glucose intolerance. And this is called gestational diabetes. Remember, gestational diabetes mellitus represents first recognition of chronic pancreatic beta cell dysfunction. GDM is a stage in the evolution of type 2 diabetes mellitus. So what if there is hyperglycemia in pregnancy? Why are we so worried? This is because impaired glucose tolerance is associated with adverse pregnancy outcome and this has been conclusively proved by the HAPO studies. The short-term effects of PGDM or GDM on pregnancy are During pregnancy, 
spontaneous miscarriage if diabetes is uncontrolled infections such as urinary tract infections preeclampsia and polyhydramnios during labor prolonged labor uterine inertia and shoulder dystocia and in puerperium puerperal sepsis and failing lactation GDM is associated with high incidence of congenital malformations especially if hyperglycemia is present during the period of organogenesis that is the first trimester this is referred to as diabetic embryopathy all systems in the fetus can be affected cardiovascular system malformations that are seen are vsd transposition asd and coarctation of aorta cns abnormalities that are seen are anencephaly holo proencephaly encephalopathy and skeletal malformations like caudal regression syndrome genito urinary abnormalities that can be seen are renal agenesis and urethral duplications gi tract abnormalities are anal atresia and tracheoesophageal fistula cleft lip and cleft palate can also occur there is an increase incidence of intrauterine fetal death especially in the last 6 weeks of pregnancy there is a 30 to 40% incidence of fetal macrosomia if gdm is untreated incidence of neonatal complications like hypoglycemia respiratory distress syndrome hyperbilirubinemia and hypocalcemia are also higher all these fetal complications contribute to an overall 2 to 3 times increase in the perinatal mortality rate gdm also has important long term consequences but i will discuss them in part 2 i will now discuss the screening come diagnosis of gdm under three subheadings universal versus selective screening when to screen and how to screen since gdm largely remains asymptomatic and since hyperglycemia is teratogenic screening for carbohydrate intolerance should ideally be done for every pregnant patient that is universal screening is recommended compared to selective screening universal screening of gdm detects more cases and improves maternal and neonatal prognosis it is generally accepted that women of asian origin and especially ethnic indians are at a higher risk of developing gdm and subsequent type 2 diabetes hence universal screening should be mandatory for all indian pregnant women to answer the question when to screen one must first know when does gdm manifest gdm can manifest in any trimester of pregnancy studies have shown that in 17% of cases it occurs prior to 16 weeks in 22% it can manifest between 16 to 24 weeks and in 61% of cases it manifests after 24 weeks that is in 38% of patients gdm develops early in the first and second trimester the clinical implication of this is that early testing is important early detection and treatment will prevent complications like fetal anomalies macrosomia polyhydramnios and preterm labor screening for gdm using the dipsy test should be done at the first antenatal visit that is between 12 to 16 weeks as screening at this time is a better predictor of gestational diabetes studies have shown that a significant number of women who had normal dipsy test in the first antenatal visit developed glucose intolerance in the subsequent visits hence if it is negative at first visit repeat 
at 24 to 28 weeks and if it is still negative then repeat at 32 to 34 weeks. There are different methods recommended for screening and diagnosis of GDM. There is a lot of debate between the two-step and single-step methods. In India, we use the single-step screening come diagnostic test recommended by Diabetes in Pregnancy Study Group of India, DIPSI. Remember, Indian problems need Indian solutions. One major advantage of DIPSI test is that it is done irrespective of the last meal. Whether she is fasting or not, it does not matter. The woman is given 75 grams that is 5 level teaspoons oral glucose load. A venous blood sample is collected after 2 hours for estimating plasma glucose by the GOD-POD method. GDM is diagnosed if the 2 hour plasma glucose is between 140 to 199 milligrams per deciliter. Whereas if it is equal to or greater than 200 milligrams per deciliter, the diagnosis is pre-gestational diabetes mellitus. Dipsy also recommends the term gestational glucose intolerance GGI instead of impaired glucose tolerance to denote values between 120 and 139 milligrams per deciliter. This is also significant because macrosomia can develop in some of these patients as well. The DIPSI test is a sort of reconciliation between the American Diabetes Association and WHO screening come diagnostic methods. DIPSI single step test is feasible, sustainable and cost effective. In 2010, American Diabetes Association Standards of Medical Care in Diabetes added the glycosated hemoglobin A1c greater than or equal to 6.5% as another criteria for diagnosis of GDM. Glycosated hemoglobin A1c level is helpful to differentiate between PGDM and GDM. If the level is more than 6%, early in pregnancy, she is likely to be a PGDM patient. This is end of part 1 of my e-lecture on GDM. For further reading on this topic and other topics in obstetrics and gynecology, refer to following books written by me. Practical Obstetrics and Gynecology Modern Obstetrics Modern Gynecology Clinical Cases in Obstetrics Questions and Answers Clinical Cases in Gynecology Questions and Answers and Pelvic Reconstructive Surgery If you have found this video useful and informative, please subscribe to my YouTube channel by clicking here.